Welcome to the 2022 Virginia Festival of the Book, presenting magic and mythical YA fantasy. I'm Sarah Lawson, Associate Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. A couple notes before we begin. Please share your questions for the authors using the Q&A tab on Zoom. This event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time with the tab at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you haven't already read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from a local bookseller, visit vabook.org, where you can also explore the schedule of upcoming programs and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org give. We appreciate the support of our community partner for helping share information about today's event, the UVA LGBT Committee for Faculty and Staff. We also thank our bookseller for this event, Fountain Bookstore in Richmond, Virginia. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. Deborah Falaya, author of Blood Scion, is a Nigerian-Canadian young adult author. She grew up in Lagos, where she spent her time devouring African literature, pestering her grandma for folktales, and tricking her grandfather into watching Passions every night. TJ Clune, author of Flashfire, is the Lambda Literary Award-winning author of The House in the Cerulean Sea, The Extraordinaries, and more. Being queer himself, Clune believes it's important, now more than ever, to have accurate, positive queer representation in stories. Anna Marie McElmore, author of Lake Lore, was born in the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains. They've written many young adult novels, including When the Moon Was Ours and The Mirror Season, both longlisted for National Book Awards. And our moderator, Emily Thede, is the author of the forthcoming novel, This Vicious Grace. Thank you all so much for being here today. Emily, take it away. Hello, welcome to today's panel. I am Emily Thede and I'm so excited to be here today with such an exceptional group of authors. Um, I will try to speak slowly, but I'm very excited, so bear with me. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about three very different books within the young adult fantasy category that in my opinion, together show just how much opportunity this category offers for authors to challenge readers, to examine real world issues through a speculative lens, to meet fascinating characters they might not otherwise, and to have adventures in compelling worlds. And I know all of you will enjoy hearing more about all of their books. Um, I would love to start by having each of you tell us a little bit about your current novels for those who may not have had the chance to read them yet. And since two of these books just came out last week, I suspect there are quite a few people in our audience who are still eagerly waiting by their mailboxes for those to arrive. Um, Deborah, could you start us off today by telling us a little bit about Blood Scion? Of course. Hi, Emily. Um, hi, guys. My name is Deborah Fly, and I am the author of Blood Sign. Blood Sign is a YA fantasy uh, inspired by Yoruba Nigerian mythology and the war on children. The story follows a young girl descended from the ancient Orisha gods uh, by the name of Sloan, who at the age of 15 gets drafted into the very military that's been hunting and killing her kind for centuries. So now uh, a child soldier in the military, her goal isn't only to survive, it's also to take down the army from within. So I like to comp it as a little bit of Hunger Games meets uh, Black Panther meets uh, Beast of No Nation with a healthy dose of magic. Thank you, Deborah. And it is a wild ride of a book. Um, <laughs> next, we'll get to visit a very, very different world than that of Blood Scion. And I would love it if Anna Marie, if you could tell us a bit more about Lake Lore next. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so yes, as Emily said, Lake Lore just came out um, this past Tuesday. It is about two Latin uh, trans non-binary teens, their respective forms of neurodivergence, specifically ADHD and dyslexia, and an enchanted world under a nearby lake that starts coming above the surface, threatening to bring everyone's secrets along with it. And it is beautiful and creative and I loved it. Thank you. Our third panelist today is here to talk about the second book in a series and I'm going to resist the urge to beg for sequel writing tips. Um, TJ, please tell us a bit about Flashfire. Yes, and now for something completely different. It is the second book in my Extraordinaries trilogy that follows a fanboy with ADHD who obsesses over the superheroes that he loves so much so that he writes uh, not healthy fan fiction about them. Um, the sequel follows the events and the fallout of the first book and Nick is meeting new enemies, new heroes and also trying to figure out how to continue his burgeoning relationship with his best friend slash boyfriend, Seth, who has some secrets of his own. And that came out last summer. And this summer we'll see Heatwave, the third and final book in the trilogy, which 
I haven't shown you guys anything yet. It is bananas and I'm very excited about it. Congratulations on completing a trilogy. I assume you were probably pretty much finished writing it and yes, my hat yes. is off it, to done. you. Edits are over and I'm ready to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, congrats. Um, thank you all so much for introducing yourself and your wonderful books. I had a wonderful time reading each of these. And one of the first things that really caught me was the different ways this, that you as the authors and that the characters themselves approach how they react to challenges, um, which range from global crises to personal struggles and relationships. The emotional tenor of each of these books uh, really spans from humorous and satirical to rage-filled and powerful to profoundly introspective. And I'm excited to hear more about the creation of each. Um, so I'd like to start today by asking each of you about how you start a new project, um, what seed you begin with, whether it is a character, a dilemma, a plot, theme, world building. And I'm curious as to whether or not your creative process varies between books or if you are consistent. And Deborah, if you could start us off, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think with Blood Sign, um, I had the character first. And um, in a sense that it's, uh, it's a book that's very much inspired by like my culture and my Yoruba heritage. Uh, so I grew up in Nigeria and uh, while I was there, you know, my grandmother would always tell these stories about the Orisha gods. So for me, it's like when I got that idea for Blood Sign, like that was the first thing that came to me. It was this young girl who was this embodiment of like my favorite Orisha who happens to be Shungo, the god of fire. Uh, so that was kind of like how it started. I feel like it does vary between projects though, because other books I could be working on, I could just immediately get this uh, plot in my head, have no idea what the character is doing, what they're, like, what they're all about, but it's just the plot stands out and that's kind of what I run with. But with Blood Sign, I felt like it was really just the character that came to me first and I just sort of like built this world around her goals and her motivation and what it was that she was like striving for. Very cool. Anna Marie, uh, what was the seed of your incredible story? So I think when I'm, when I'm thinking about, I'm often thinking about character and setting at the same time, because I'm thinking about how they're going to like bump up against each other. So within that is often, is often like, what, what problem does a character, does a character need to like figure out within themselves? And what, what is that going to look like, like in relation to the world around them? Like, where are they going to, like, where are they going to bump up against that in the world around them? Um, and in Lake Lord, it became very literal, like the, the sort of landscapes of these two characters' brains, like coming to life in glitter jars and alebrijas and like this sort of blurring together of underwater landscape and like landscape on land. So what I, what I think I often do is setting in character um, became very like very bright and shimmery and very visible in Lake Lore in in a way that was a lot of fun to write because I, I got to write sort of like, what is it, what does it feel like, like inside your brain and what happens when that comes to life? Um, and a lot of that is beautiful. And a lot of that is absolutely terrifying. So having that line within like speculative fiction, within magic, within this sort of like weird portal fantasy, because that's often what's happening with magic. Like it's like, it's beautiful. And it's also kind of terrifying many, many times. So those, those different elements kind of came together and like, okay, this is, this is what I want to write. I want to write this. I want to write this book about these two characters. I want to write this book about how their brains work and how they work with their brains. And I, I want to write this like lake magic at the same time. It was fascinating. Uh, you know, books are not thought of as a visual media, but reading your book very much felt like the experience of someone sort of drawing thoughts out of someone's head and turning it into a visual art, which was really fascinating to see. Um, TJ, your book is very different. I particularly enjoyed uh, humor. I, I love when characters respond to stressful situations by cracking jokes, especially when mm -hmm. it's inappropriate. So I'd yes. love to hear more about kind of how you find that voice for your characters, whether it's just, whether that happens initially when you start writing or do you layer it in as you go and yeah tell us about that no i i am a character driven author first uh i hear characters in my head and when you have a disaster twink like nick bell he is very loud and very insistent so when um he first started making himself known um and he would not shut up at any single point i knew that there was something there with him and i i 
tend to, I like, I like Anna Marie's talking, uh, talking about setting and character and how those things intertwine, because that's how it is for me too. I'm a very visual writer. I, I, I want, I, when I, when I have, when readers get their hands on my books, I want them to actually feel like they're in the moment, whether it's in a bustling city like Nova City in the series, or if it's a tea shop like Under the Whispering Door or the house in the Cerulean Sea, I want it to be almost a sensory experience. And so with that, you have, you want to, you want to build the story around that sensory experience while not going into purple prose or, or, or trying to oversell it. And I, I just love the idea of, of a book being the feast for the senses, but for me, it always comes down to character work first, starting with the character. And I don't know that I just think that there's nothing like a loud, obnoxious character who acts first and then thinks maybe a little bit later or whose mouth tends to move before his brain does. And that just makes me happy to know that that we can write characters like that and we can laugh with them when they when they fail. But we can also appreciate when they succeed because you want to end up rooting for them. Absolutely. Um, one of my favorite pieces of writing advice ever was just make them say the awkward thing. Um, yeah. Because I think a lot of us as authors have a tendency to want to, we want to protect our characters as though they were real. And I uh, once had a, yeah, a mentor I, tell me, no, just say the awkward thing. And it makes for fun characters. Exactly. Because I constantly say the awkward thing because I don't necessarily <laughs> have a filter. And so if, if, I, if I do that, then why wouldn't I want my characters to do that? 100%. And that actually leads me nicely into my next question, which is really about um, all three of your books tackle different forms of, of marginalization, neurodivergence, all different ways that the characters maybe feel like they aren't centralized in their own community or in their own world. And I'd love to hear more about how you use a speculative lens to explore that, um, whether you think it gives you more distance from the issue or whether it allows you to dig deeper. Um, and anyone can go first if you would like to jump in. I mean, I feel like in Blood Sign, um, I had like a thing where the people who had magic, um, they were sort of like the oppressed um, people. And you had these settlers, these um, elite colonizers who came into this land, invaded it, uh, took over the culture, took over the land, took over everything really, and just started to hunt down all these people with magic. And I think for me, um, colonization is something that's very real. And this is like a history of like the world that is so like people are still dealing with the impacts of it to this day. Um, and especially being like Nigeria, um, Nigerian, I feel like my home country, uh, the effects of colonization is very much still rampant all across Nigeria. And I really wanted to explore that idea, but also put it in a setting that allowed me, I guess, because I think that's the thing with fantasy, right? It's like, it allows you to sort of like take these real world issues but also not feel this sort of like constraint in writing or talking about it, right? Um, and I think that was what with blood science setting and putting in like fantasy, I think that's what it allowed me to do. I was able to explore this idea, like you said, of like the other, you know, which is this people with the magic uh, and having to sort of like hide pieces of themselves or like suffer the brutality of like being hunted down and killed in their homeland, which is something that's like very much real and very much true to like history, but also putting in this setting that allowed me to sort of like explore it freely and as free as I could, I could do it. So, yeah. Thank you. If there is one thing that people with ADHD like to do is to talk about their ADHD. So <laughs> I'm going to probably go with that for a little bit. And then Anna Marie can and add in whatever she wants because or whatever they want, because I know they have such wonderful things to say about it. But um, Nick Bell is like me. He is neurodiverse. He has ADHD. And in the first book, he does not like it as he, he, he thinks it's a diagnosis that has fault. He thinks that he is not necessarily broken, maybe chipped just a little bit. But what I love about being able to write a series and a trilogy in this way is that we can see his growth from, from being that character that we saw in the first few pages to where he's learning to accept himself. And, and, and beyond that, he's learning to, to not only understand himself, but appreciate himself more in the way his mind works. And I think that a lot of times um, people who are neurodiverse, meaning ADD, ADHD, and we can even include people with autism as that does fall under that umbrella, 
we, we think that, or people think about us that we have a deficit somehow, that we're broken. We're, we're not, you know, as a, as a little pithy aside, as it says in the book, we, we're, we just have something extra. It's not as if we need to be fixed and we need to be cured. And what I wanted to show that through this book is that I did have this great big world where the superheroes are, are happening in, in this major city and there's a, there's a battle going on to protect the city and, and who will win and whatnot. But that is really a backdrop to the journey of this, this neurodiverse queer kid who is trying to find himself, trying to, to impress his friends and his father, while also dealing with some very real issues in terms of in terms of his medical health and also with the fact that he recently lost his mother. And all of these things can combine into, into chaos, which is exactly what this book turns into. But I think that it's important that we, even if the, the fantastical is happening around these characters, that we that we get very realistic and specific when we talk about this person's ADHD and what it means for him as a teenager, a queer teenager, and not just base it on a bunch of tropes that some people think seem to think ADHD actually is. It varies for everyone. There's no right or wrong way to have ADHD. It just is. And I think it's important that we continue to have these conversations and talk about it and be lucky enough to be in a position like I am to put characters like Nick front and center of their own stories because we don't get to have that a lot. And I think it's important that we get to see ourselves in the, what we read. Absolutely. As someone who accidentally wrote a book that I did not intend to be a metaphor about coming to grips with late diagnosed ADHD, um, but is, I feel that very deeply. Anna Marie, could you tell us more about yours? I probably am also going to talk about ADHD at some point in this answer, although with a certain amount of apprehension, because as I've started talking about this book on panels, it's as though like every time I talk about ADHD, I summon a butterfly or a cat that goes by and I completely lose the train of thought. It's just all, it's just all very of a piece, I suppose. So if I get that like far off look, you'll know that there was a cat outside my building. Um, so thinking about, thinking about magic and thinking about magic and identity. One of the things that I love about writing speculative fiction is that it makes characters face the same thing, the same thing that readers are facing or need to face. Through, through magic, um, we can talk about things that are, difficult to, that are difficult to talk about, things that we don't want to talk about or don't know how to talk about sometimes, especially like within our communities, conversations that we need to have and in the case of Lake Lore, it makes it makes these characters like re-examine things that they're pretty sure that they have dealt with, but that they haven't dealt with. And I think that that happens to all of us, where we're kind of like, no, we're, I'm I'm fine, like related to this particular thing, like I'm I'm fine, don't need to think about it anymore. Um, but a lot of what comes up with this magic is this sort of lake magic is making these characters think about what what they haven't wanted to think about and think they don't that they don't need to anymore um in the case of bastian part of that is adhd because they um they were diagnosed earlier in life and has so many systems in place that bastian is one of the most outwardly organized people you will ever meet but that's because inside their brain it's it's kind of like it's it's kind of everything like there are like there are glitter there's glitter and everybody has some like and like cats and puppies everywhere, just like going around inside their brain. So they need those outward or those outward systems. And they've adapted very well to very, very well to like this diagnosis and what it means for their life. But they in some ways haven't thought like, how does this intersect with my gender identity as a trans guy? How does my how does my identity as a trans guy intersect with with me being with me being Mexican American? How has machismo, how has toxic masculinity in the wider world impacted what I think um, a boy is, what I think a man is? So Bastian has to start looking at these things that are colliding together and a lot of the magic in, um, in the world under the lake and then, and then on land as the, world, as the world under the lake comes above land, it's a lot about those, about those collisions, like what what about these interactions do I need to think about? Um, even as I think like, okay, I figured out that, that it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be work dealing with how my brain works. I figured out that there are certain things I need to think about related to my gender identity. And I love like, like, I love my culture. I love my cultural traditions. 
but then thinking about as these as these magical aspects collide, like, oh, I need to think about like, I am one whole person. All of these things exist within me, within my heart, within my brain, and they're all pulling on each other and interacting and interacting with each other and having an impact on, on each other in ways that I'm, I'm not fully going to embrace myself as, as a whole person until I address those ways that those things come together. Thank you. That was a beautiful description. I also wanted to remind our audience real quick, because I forgot to do it earlier, um, that we will be taking questions at the end. So if anyone does have questions, please do go ahead and submit those to the Q&A, because um, I'm sure people are very curious. Um, my next question is more of a prompt, I think. It's more sort of a topic. Um, I noticed themes in all three of your books that have to do with power and authority. And I think this is, in many ways, a hallmark of the YA genre um, as a, a category but also that speculative YA offers some very unique opportunities for us as authors to, to let our characters gain power and navigate power and authority in a different way. And I would just love to hear any thoughts you have about what was going through your head when you were deciding how your characters were going to interact with, whether it's parents, teachers, oppo you know, opponents in a war or a superhero battle, um, that theme of sort of dealing with people that are more powerful in some ways, but perhaps less powerful in other ways. Um, I'd just love to hear more about what you think about that. That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Um, I, I think I think that, you know, if, if we're gonna be looking at like superhero, since I'm writing about superheroes, obviously there, there is that power fantasy. I think that growing up when in when I was um, in the 90s, X-Men was the greatest thing in the world. I, I started reading when they rebooted it with the new X-Men number one. And I'm pretty sure that Wolverine made me queer. And it's, you know... <laughs> <laughs> sorry a cat just walked by in front of my window and now I'm just thinking of where sorry I'm just gonna reason. really quickly plug my book for reasons you'll understand when you read it continue so um I'm I'm I when I was a kid I always had um I had undiagnosed ADHD I was coming into my queerness and when you have that it creates an otherness inside of you because you you, you are these you are these things that you've only heard about spoken with, with trepidation and fear. And it creates in the inside of you this otherness that, that doesn't allow you to relate to your peers or doesn't allow you to, to understand, let them understand you because you don't think it's possible. So for me, when I was a kid, when I had that otherness inside of me, I turned to comics because comics were the ultimate power fantasy, not just because people had superpowers, but at the same time, because these people had an otherness inside of them too. It wasn't that they had ADHD or it wasn't that they were queer, even though to me, I think many comics are queer coded. Um, but at the same time, they had this, this, this otherness about them that some people feared, that some people respected. And all at the same time, they, that a lot of them hid their identities away. To, so the real world wouldn't be able to see them for who they were and what powers that they had. And I thought about that a lot when I was a kid and you know, the way teenagers do, wishing that, oh, man, I wish I could be a superhero. I wish I could hide my identity so nobody could see my faults or anything like that. But what the thing is, is that when you, get, when you get older and you realize that these are essentially just power fantasies, but at the same time, it doesn't have to be about power itself. That's why I love comics is they have so many different layers. You could read it as just a power fantasy, or you could read it as all these different coded things that go into it about being ostracized, about being, um, having, being, having, experiencing bigotry and prejudice going along with it. And I just, when you, when you are different and when you're growing up being different, you want to be powerful because you want people to to respect you. You want people to think that you're not this weird, lonely kid who doesn't shut up and who may be a little effeminate. So I think power in general is relative. I think it's just, I like the power, the idea of not necessarily superpowers, but the power of people and what they can do when they come together. And I think that that's why I write a, a lot about people coming together and finding each other, because I think that's important. I love that. And Deborah, your book is very I think very direct when it comes to a character regaining power and taking power back from people who have stripped it from her and her community. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about, was that 
invigorating for you? Was it stressful? I mean, it's a big task to challenge, a big challenge to, yeah. No, it really was. Um, so, I mean, I think speaking of power, um, you know, with blood sign, it's like you have this girl, this young girl who uh, knows that she's descended from the gods, but she cannot tap into that magic. She can't. She's being told by the world around her that this power and this magic that you have, it makes you a threat. It makes you, you know, someone that could get killed at any point in time if this was to be discovered. Um, so, you know, you meet this young character at the age of 15 who's sort of like had to live her whole life suppressing who she is. And metaphorically and also just literally in the sense that she's, you know, in blood sign, it's like there was a point in time when she mentions that even her last name, she can't even utter her last name. She can't tell anyone who she is or like speak openly about her identity for fear of like being killed. Um, so every aspect of power that this young girl is meant to have has been stripped away from her. Um, and then she goes on like this journey towards not only reclaiming back that identity, but also reclaiming back that power, taking back that piece of herself that they've sort of like told her this is wrong for you to have. And I, that was that was like the ending of Blood Sign is probably the best part of the book for me. I had the best time writing that because I think um, it goes with, without saying to, you know, as like Black women and just Black people, um, there's a lot of, um, you know, things that like, I think Black women, like we go through and like we face and this idea of like um, not having to sort of like embrace completely who you are or just completely embrace like this identity, right? For fear of some of the really harsh realities that we're seeing in today's society. And I wanted blood sign to mirror that. And I thought, you know, um, there's something really important to be for a reader to pick up on and latch onto with this idea of taking back something that has been deemed worthless or society has told you, no, this is not something for you to believe in. This is not something for you to embrace. And just as a, as a character, being able to take that and, and own that and claim it back, I just think it's like such a powerful thing. And that was, yeah, that was something that was really big in Blood Sign. And that was something I, I had a really, um, I had a fun time tapping into and writing. Beautifully said. And Anamari, your book is a more, um, I don't want to say realistic because it, it is not. I mean, there are so many fantasy elements woven into every aspect of the story, but you do have characters that are going through, you know, going through school, going through dealing with bullies. Um, and so I think the the power issues that I noticed in your book were perhaps a little more subtle, but I was really interested in how characters interacted specifically, you know, with there's a, there's a counselor in the book, there are parents in the book. And if you have thoughts on how you shape those relationships in the book to kind of reflect that power shift as the book goes along. Yeah, I'm glad you. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the um, the counselor in in the book that because I I wasn't necessarily gonna think gonna talk about um, Amanda the learning specialist who is called Amanda the learning specialist every single time because this character Laura can never forget like this is the person who is gonna report to the school about how I'm doing, so that's sort of a power dynamic there. Like Laura, Laura comes from this like comes from a school that they were previously at and is now transferring to a different school, living in a different town and is thinking, okay, I need to be somebody other than who I was at that, like at this previous school where I did this horrible thing that meant that my family had to move. That meant that our life in that town and my life at that school was over and we had to move because of me. I am the villain in this story because of this thing that I did. And now I'm in this position where like, I need to, I need to convince this, I need to convince this learning specialist. I need to convince Amanda, the learning specialist that I am like a, I am a good kid because everybody told me I was a bad kid at that previous school. So that power dynamic of like, of Lore thinking, well, the, that power dynamic definitely exists, but not in the way Lore thinks it does because Amanda, the learning specialist is actually there to help Lore. And there are people there are people in Laura's life who think like, no, this was what you think happened isn't actually what happened. Yes, you did this thing, but it was the result of, it was the result of many people who had power, one, deciding you were a bad kid, 
because you're because you're trans, non-binary, because you're brown, because you because you're dyslexic and you're struggling with things that are just hard for you, but sometimes are viewed as you being difficult or you not cooperating with the learning process. So there are people there are people around lore who are who want to help them reframe that. But in the beginning, this is Laura thinking like, okay, I need to convince Amanda, the learning specialist, that I that I'm walking around with this little halo, and that I'm not everything that everything that she is reading in my file, because I can't carry that into my new school, or it's all gonna happen again. I can't have teachers here thinking that, or it's or it's all gonna happen again, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a bad kid again. I'm gonna be the villain here again. And part of this, part of Laura's story is is seeing, oh, this happened and this happened and this happened. And these were power systems in place that, that made me, that put me, that backed me into the corner I was backed into when I did what I did. And when I did that, they got to, they got to point at me and say, see, we're, this, this kid is exactly everything that we have said. So that process of okay okay there are there were power systems in place that are a lot are a lot more complicated than i thought about and a lot and that have a lot more nuance to them than i thought about even though like lore like lore understands transphobia and racism and and ableism from their own life but in that situation where this this heartbreaking situation that changed everything applying that, applying what you know, and stepping out of that story that has been written for you, that, that takes one, recognizing the power structures that are there, two, having people who are going to be your allies in recognizing that and supporting you in that, and three, taking the power that you do have, because a lot of what Laura realizes in this story is like, you, like, I don't, I don't have as much power as I should, but I also have more power than I think I do. Beautifully said. And I thought your book was a beautiful example of how um, stakes that seem, I don't want to use the word small, but you know, when we think of fantasy, sometimes there are global wars or, you know, wars across planets. And in your book, this, I think the most compelling sort of emotional stakes um, feel just as huge as any larger battle. Um, and so my next question is a bit of a change of topic, and it can be answered by any or all of you, but it's one of my favorite questions because the farther I get into the world of YA, the more I realize how many people will argue with us about what actually makes the YA book. Um, I think a lot of people who aren't familiar with YA might not realize how many adult books have, you know, teen main characters or multiple main characters of different ages. And so I always love to ask authors, what for you is the defining feature of young adult versus any other age group? And anyone can jump in with thoughts. Okay. Uh, the, I mean, for me, it has to involve teenagers. I mean, it's pretty simple because I, something that kind of blew my mind was when the house in the cerulean sea came out, people, some people were classifying that as YA when it's a 40 year old man is the main narrator. And that's not, it was not meant to be YA in any way, shape or form. He was a bored bureaucrat. What about that screams young adult? That book was meant to be for anyone who wanted to read it. But for me, I think that YA should be kids that are 13 to 17, 18, I think gets probably to the new adult territory because then you're going off to college and stuff like that. But YA is because then below that is middle grade, below that is children. So I think 13 to 17 is the, is the right age range for the characters in YA. But that doesn't mean you have to be that age to read them. Anybody can read YA. Anybody can. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter if you've don't have ADHD or or you, 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 you can fly and shoot lasers out of your face. It doesn't matter any of that. They're, what books, books, that's what I love about books. They're for anyone who wants to read them. You, you don't, the only reason that we have the classification of YA is just to help delineate what books are better, can be for children, for, for teenagers. And it helps with librarians and bookstores and stuff like that. But I hate the I, I hate the look on some people's faces when when others say they read YA and you're like, well, you're not a teenager. Who the hell cares? Read whatever you want to read. Don't worry about what other people read. Read what you want to read and mind your business. Sorry, that was a rant that I felt a long time ago. No, I feel that. I've always thought whenever people try to 
make that case for why the first thing I always say is, what does coming of age mean to you? Because I've heard a lot of people are like, coming of age is literary and deep and thoughtful and for everyone. I'm like, so... But does anyone right. have any different but thoughts? Just, yeah. But as you, as you said, one of my favorite books of all time is uh, the, A Boy's Life by Robert McCammon. And that follows a 12, 13-year-old boy named Corey. But that is not a young adult book. That is not a children's book. It deals with some very serious, heavy issues. And it's very clearly written for adults. I just think that we have to... <laughs> When there are books for teenagers geared towards teenagers, anybody can still read them. Good, good on that one. <laughs> all right. Um, as we all know, times are uncertain and stressful these days. Um, do you feel that young adult fiction especially plays a special role for readers right now? And if so, how or if, you think it's changed over the past the past few years or if it's going to based on what the world's going through. You know, I think some people expect that the more serious life gets, the more um, our book tastes are going to veer towards things that are light and escapist. Other people think that we should, you know, find books that hit us where we are. And I would just love to hear your thoughts about um, how it has influenced what you want to write, what you want to read, and whether or not you think it's going to shift things in the industry over the next year or so. I mean, I feel like I find myself uh, as an author uh, diving more into like the serious stories um, just to, as a way of like, I guess, coping with what's happening around me. Um, and I find myself also reaching for like those type of books a lot. And um, I think even heavier books can, you know, they can, they can offer some sort of like escape as well, um, regardless of like what it is that like they deal with. Um, I will say that I feel like it varies in terms of like what people want. I've seen a lot more of, you know, books that are just sort of like the fun, lighthearted and, you know, books. And I think those are, those are great in the world. We need that. We need, we need a little bit of joy. Right. Um, but I've also seen like the, you know, the really heavy books and, you know, like the more like, you know, really just books that really dive into like all of these issues and things that are happening in the world. And I think you also need that too. And I think it's just going to vary with the reader, like what, what it is that the reader is more so inclined to pick up, you know. Anna Marie, do you have thoughts? Yeah. Um, so for me, I'm, and I, I think I've like, I've heard this in talking to, in, in talking to read other readers and writers. Um, I think sometimes, especially with, especially with how the world is at the moment, um, the books that are, the books that are going to talk to a part of me that I didn't know needed to be, needed to be spoken to become even more important. Um, the book I, the book I just thought of, um, not, um, not speculative fiction, but a book that was just really, really important to me was So Many Beginnings by Bethany C. Morrow. And it was a book that I picked up because like Bethany C. Morrow is writing Little Women. I want to read this book. That's why I picked it up. But when I read this book and just this, this, uh, I, I'm just, I have to not, I have to, I get this way about books that I love. Like I get very incoherent, incoherent about them. Um, that book talked to a part of me that didn't realize like, okay, I thought there was something wrong with me growing up because I didn't love Little Women. Like, but I needed this Little Women. Like I needed, I, I needed this, I needed this book to talk to me in a way that Little Women wasn't. And also that made me think about like, okay, the fact that the fact that little women didn't talk to me the way that I thought that I thought that it was supposed to growing up, that made me think that a bunch of things were wrong with me when really, no, I was just different. And I was different in a lot of ways that was going to make it hard for, for that book to find me in a way that it was going to find a lot of other, of a lot of other readers. And to the, to the readers who it did find in that way, I think it's beautiful whenever a book does that, but I needed Bethany C. Morrow's Little Women. And in times that are in times that are difficult, in times that are heartbreaking, those books that find us and talk to a part of us that in a way that we didn't even know we need, I think those, they become even more important and they become even more the books that we are like, here, you need to like, you need to read this or please let me share this book with you. And hearing those kinds of recommendations um, has often has like my whole life has been often been how I read and still is 
because I want to know that from, I want to know that from other people. Like what was the book that talked to you that way? Beautifully said. And if any of you do have book recommendations, um, I'd love to hear them too. Um, I'd also like to ask, this is a fun question. Um, I've often heard people ask authors, would you like to spend a day with your characters? But I like to ask, would your characters like to spend the day with you? Um, and if anyone has thoughts on that, I'd yeah, love to hear it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would love to spend a day with Nicholas Bell. Granted, things would either burn down or explode or we would get arrested. And I'm pretty sure that I would be okay with that. But it's, um, look, <laughs> I think every author puts a part of themselves into their characters. And I think Nick Bell is probably the most I've ever put of myself into a character. So I like me. So I would be okay with, <laughs> with a little version of me. It was totally fine. <laughs> Great answer. Deborah, what do you think? Would your characters yeah, hang out with you? <laughs> like already shaking my head. Um, I one, I, I don't think I would survive. Like I don't even think I would last a minute um in, in my character's world. <laughs> I'm just plop in there and just get killed immediately. Um, but would they spend like a I I I mean I I I love to think that my main character Sloan would you know spend a day with me. I think if she could be in my world should probably consider like some sort of like vacation away from like the brutality of her own world. Um, I think she would spend a day with me because like TJ said, um, I think, you know, as authors, yeah, we definitely do put up pieces of like ourselves into these characters. And um, this is like the first book that I, I wrote. Um, and so there was a lot of myself that was definitely put into uh, building Sloan. And I think that we would um, absolutely get along. I should she'd probably beat me up <laughs> if I said the wrong things, but um, so I'd have to be careful what I say around her. But yeah, I think, I think it'd be fun to spend a day with her. Anna-Marie? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about ADHD again, which means summon the butterflies and the cats. Um, so Bastian, who's the character with ADHD, has a lot going on inside their brain, um, but is quieter externally, which is often something that people don't think of with ADHD. Like there's a whole, there's the whole range, like TJ was talking about, like there's, there are so many experiences with any kind of, with, with any kind of neurodivergence, there's a range of experiences. So I think if I was, if I was with like Lauren Bastian or Bastian might feel slightly outnumbered because Laura and I are both kind of like all over the place like we're energetic and everything and Bastian's a little quieter and like and he like they'd probably be like whoa whoa what's what's going on here like there's there's a lot of there's a lot of energy here um because it's like sometimes when sometimes when you when you have ADHD if you're in a particular brain space like you can be around people you like and still be kind of overwhelmed so I think Laura would be totally fi fine. And I think Bastian would be more like, oh, they're, they're two, like, they're two people bouncing around everywhere. Like what, what's going on here? I love it. I once took this question, not literally enough. And I had commented on Twitter that I would love to spend a day with my characters and a fellow 22 debut commented, Emily, if your characters knock on your door, run because you're in danger. I thought that's a good point. I have not been very kind to them. Um, uh, does anyone have, do any of you have any recommendations for books that have really resonated with you recently that you think that uh, readers should check out? Lake Lore by this author called Anna Marie McLemore. I got to read Lake Lore last fall, last September-ish, sometime, whatever. And it was, it was just one of the best things I've read in a very long time. And look, look, yeah, yes, we're talking, we've, we've talked about the, the magic of Lake Laura. We've talked about the, the neurodivergence and, and the queer representation. But I just, I have to say that Anna Marie's prose is just good freaking God. It was so good. It was so good. I was talking, uh, Anna Marie, I was talking about the book at uh, one of my panels at the Tucson Book Festival. And I, I told the, the crowd watching that it's one of the few books that I've ever been jealous of because I wish I could have written that. But then when you take a step back from that, you realize that it was Anna Marie's story to tell and that no one could have written it like them. And I just, I am so happy that that book is finally out. So that is my recommendation is Anna Marie's uh, Lake Lore. Oh, thank you so much. That was lovely. Love putting authors on the spot to accept compliments because we're all so great at it, right? <laughs> Deborah, have you read anything recently that really jumped out at you? 
Uh, I did. Uh, this was this was a contemporary because I, I love fantasy, but I also love diving into the contemporary. I also love writing contemporary. Um, but I I read uh this book called Twice as Perfect. Uh, it's by Louisa Oname, and uh, this is her second book. Um, and it's just the most beautiful book like that's that's all I've ever been able to say about it just because um for me I feel like you know when you go into a book and you're sort of like looking for representation and um just sort of like searching for yourself in stories I felt like that was a book that really made me feel so seen like I just you know, from like a lot of like the themes that the the main character was dealing with, like this uh, clash of like identity between being African and also sort of like switching into like a a little bit of like being Canadian or being like American, you know, to other, like to like, you know, some of like her other friends or just like this pressure that you have as like a marginalized um, daughter like growing up like a daughter of like an immigrant parent like growing up and just sort of like feeling this pressure to succeed you know because your parents have given you so much they've done so much and you just want to you want to show them that yes you brought me here and you know I'm I'm gonna thrive I'm gonna do all this like those were some of the themes that were really in that story and I do every point I, I read I was just like yes 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 like it just it meant so much to me um really beautiful book and I think it comes out this summer I believe so I would yeah definitely check that out if you guys are able to. Wonderful. Anna Marie do you have any specific books that are floating around in your brain right now? So I just started An Arrow to the Moon by Emily X. R. Penn which I'm really which I'm really excited to get further into um, because I'm thinking of The Astonishing Color of After and I I just really love the way that in like in a speculative fiction way like Emily writes about things that are like things that are difficult, things that are heartbreaking, like writes about writes about grief through these like through these elements where you're not you're not quite sure what's real and you're not quite sure what isn't because that is that is how disorienting something like grief is. So um, I, I love the way that she does that. I love the way that she uses speculative elements to address like very, like very real things. And I'm I'm excited to get to get deeper into Arrow in the Moon, which comes out next month. Wonderful recommendations. That reminded me of one that I'm going to recommend too, because we're just going to make sure that the Virginia Festival of the Book people have to stay on their toes with those links. Um, I will recommend one that came out last year um, in a similar vein as what Anna Marie was recommending, uh, which is called Vampires, Hearts, and Other Dead Things um, by Margie Houston, which is another example of how um, you can use speculative fiction to explore deep things like grief while also adding um, sort of an escapist fun Thing. So I just highly recommend that book. Um, and to remind all of our listeners today, uh, we encourage you all to look into everyone on the panel's books, of course. And some of you have quite a few. Anna Marie, have, you have quite a back catalog. Um, and we encourage people to order through independent bookstores, specifically um, the Fountain Bookstore in Richmond is wonderful. Um, so check them out. We have a few more minutes, so we'll do a few more quick questions. Um, and if anyone in the audience does have questions for our panelists, please do put them up as soon as possible so we can try to get to those. Um, I would love to hear from any of you if you have ever gotten a piece of writing advice that you thought was terrible. Um, We all talk about good writing advice, but I think um, sometimes knowing what advice does not work for you is just as important. And I would love to hear your thoughts. My God, there's a whole lot. Um, I think the the one that comes uh, to me right away is this idea that you have to, you know, write a lot of words a day in a day. For, for you to be an author, for you to be a writer. And as someone who writes really, really slow, like I think on a good day, I'm happy if I'm like getting to like 500 words. <laughs> um, that really messed me up in the beginning. Just this idea that I felt like, oh my God, I can't succeed in this industry. Or I can't thrive in this industry if I wasn't churning out 2,000, 10,000 words a day. <laughs> Um, and I think that's just terrible. That's just terrible advice uh, because everyone's technique is very different. You know, everyone's the way we work. Like sometimes you, you're not writing and you're still working. You're still producing, uh, brainstorming and just, you know, even doodling, <laughs> you know, spending time on Pinterest. Like that's all that that all counts. Um, 
So it's just, yeah, I just, I think that's a really terrible advice. And if there's any sort of like uh, any aspiring writers listening to this, please don't take that advice. Just do what, do what works for you. I believe there's a Twitter account that is so called counts as writing and you can tag them and say, does this count as writing? Just whatever it is that you're doing. And they will respond. Yes, that counts as writing. So agreed. Um, TJ or Anne-Marie, do you have terrible writing advice that you'd like to share? <laughs> Yeah, to, to build off what Deborah was saying, the, the, some of the worst advice you could get from people is that they tell you you have to write every day. That is just actual bull crap. There's days when I'm sitting in front of my computer and I just want to throw my laptop through the window because it, nothing's coming out. It's just, don't, you don't have to write every day. You don't have to. And that's just stupid if anybody tells you otherwise, because the more you try to brute force a writer's block or just a, a block in your head, the, well, that's only going to end up pissing you off more and you're not going to get anything done then. And it's just, it's not how it works. But I will say that um, one of the worst <laughs> pieces of advice that I've ever received was that you should basically, hmm, I'll try to keep this PG-13, that you basically have, you should, since you are an author working with a big publishing house, that you should let the publishing house do whatever they want. That they can, they can, they can, since they're the one paying you, since they are the one gifting you with the opportunity to write for them, you don't wanna, you don't wanna make waves, you don't wanna back talk. That is bull crap because if something is not going right, if something doesn't feel good to you, it's your book. These are your words. You need to use your voice. It can be scary. It can be very scary, especially if you're a new author that you don't know what is or what is not allowed but trust me if there is something that you feel is wrong speak up because a it might just be something that no one else saw and that you have to uh, bring to their attention they'll be like oh thank you or if it's something that somebody has a problem with go above them i am the type of person that believes that if something is wrong this is something that you should be a part of because these are your words. At the very end of the day, yes, a bunch of people work on a book, but at the end of the day, it's your name with your cover. And so you've just never, ever let something go that you think needs to be addressed because of the fact that you want to let, just let things go, let things live, make things easier. Don't speak up because you have to use your voice. Otherwise you're just going to get walked over. Very good pep talk for us. 22 debuts, right, Deborah? <laughs> Anna Marie, do you have any terrible writing advice? Oh, I I might be about to do something you're never supposed to do, which is pop, <laughs> like lightly criticize another book. So I will preface this by saying, I think like the the deep work book, I think it's by Cal Newport, like has, I, I understand the value of that advice. Like I read it, there's some stuff in it. That's sort of like but that sort of deep work, like you work for three hours or more, like, and that's what you need to do to do valuable work. I find that really hard advice related to writing or related to a lot of things. Cause one, it's not realistic for so many of us with like day jobs. Those of us who are caretakers, those of us who have unpredictable schedules, it's just not possible for a lot of us. And also our brains work differently. Some of us are going to work better in like the smaller bursts. Some of us are going to work better when we can, when we can find more time to set aside, even if that time is a lot less frequent. Um, but I think this idea of any sort of idea of like your work sessions need to be this length of time, or they need to be at this particular time of day, which is, which is advice I'll get to like, definitely you should write in the morning or something. Well, you should write in the morning if it works for you to write in, to write in the morning. Um, but I think our brains are so different that you're, you're not going to know that until you've, until you've sort of found what works for you. And it's okay if that changes. It probably will. Our brains change throughout our lives. So any like, you must work for this amount of time. If you have access to that time and you, and that does work for you, great. If it doesn't, like, your creative brain isn't broken and there's nothing wrong with you. And the words that you, the words that you produce in 15 minutes or 30 minutes are not less valuable than what you produce in, in a long, like in a long session. It's cause you're going to like, in any event, you're going to revise those words and you're going to get them to ultimately fit with what feels right for your story. And that's, that's what's, that's what, where the value is it like the words telling the story that you want to tell. That is, that is absolutely true because I, I, I can't write at night. 
I can't, I have to write after I wake up and, and once three o'clock hits, three o'clock hits, I can't write anything after that. I don't want to, because my brain is dead. You have to find what works for you. Don't, everybody wants to give you advice. Trust me, every, your entire life, people want to give you advice, but sometimes you, you do want to figure out what works for you. Very true. And in publishing and writing, especially, I think uh, as soon as you figure out what works, it's going to change because that is how creativity works. Um, before we go, I did want to, we had one shout out in our Q&A, which was a reminder that I thought was worth sharing. Uh, that is that the SCBWI Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators does offer many virtual webinars for YA middle grade and picture books. And so um, one of our viewers wanted to remind people to check those out if you are an aspiring author. And unfortunately, because I would love to keep all of you forever. Um, it is about time for us to wrap things up. So I want to thank our authors and everyone who tuned in. Please consider buying these featured books from your local bookseller using the links provided on vabook.org or through the links in the chat. Uh, they are all wonderful. I can vouch for it. Uh, you can also explore the rest of the 2022 Virginia Festival of the Book Schedule, which runs through March 20th at vabook.org. And there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening, uh, both locally for people who can make it here in person and virtually. So we highly recommend everyone checks it out. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. This was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank you for hosting. You did such a good job. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Great job, Emily. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.